And what a blessing it is uh, to be here. And uh, open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter number 17. 1 Kings 17, Lord willing, we'll try to, uh, we'll stick with this theme. Somebody asked me what the theme was. I do try to have a theme as I preach. And we're going to learn this week some lessons from, from Elijah. Amen. Examples from Elijah. 1 Kings chapter number 17. I don't think I'm going to be able to stay behind this microphone if that's all right. <laughs> on, like I'm in a cage. But I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a little louder so you can hear me. But 1 Kings chapter number 17. Let's go ahead and read 1 through 7. We'll have prayer and then we'll jump right in it uh, this afternoon. 1 Kings chapter number 17. The Bible says, And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up, because there had been, been no rain in the land. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another time we can come out to summer camp. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already experienced. Thank you for the songs, the singing the prayers and testimonies. Lord, thank you for just what you have done, and we look forward to what you're going to do, and we know the power is in this book. We pray, God, the Word of God would have free course. I pray that you'd set me aside, that you might just preach through me, Lord, and that you may be a blessing to your people. Thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. 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 Now, let me give you just a little introductory information about Elijah before we jump into the message from 1 Kings chapter 17 this afternoon. Elijah, the actual name Elijah means my God is Jehovah. My God is Jehovah. And when you think about Elijah, he just kind of pops up on scripture. You open your Bible and you read along there, 1 Kings 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, 15, 16, and then 17, there he is. Here's this fella, he pops up and he stands in front of Ahab and he pronounces judgment on the nation of Israel. And so with him, we find a man who is a preacher, a prophet, that with him is either black or white. It's either heaven or hell. You're either cold or you're hot. You're either in with God or you're out. And Elijah is just one of those characters. And, and you find some things about these prophets that God would do in Old Testament times. He'd raise up men in times of declension and apostasy in Israel to stand against the nation. And the Bible actually says in Romans 11 verse number 2 that Elijah made intercession to God against Israel. It's one thing to have somebody praying for you, but it's another thing to have somebody praying against you. And that's what Elijah did. Don't you know that uh, Jesus Christ was, they confused Jesus Christ for Elijah. Yeah. Matthew chapter number 16, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? They said, oh, you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets or Elias. Elias, which is the New Testament way to say Elijah from the Old Testament. So Jesus wasn't some panty waist preacher. Jesus was a prophet that pronounced judgment on the nation. And they mistook him for Elijah. Elijah is a huge character in the Old Testament. Amen. Absolutely huge. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter number 17, turn over there and look at this with me. Matthew chapter number 17 in the New Testament. This is a very important part of Christ's ministry here where he goes on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter number 17. He takes Peter, James, and John, verse number one, up into a high mountain. Look in verse number two. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, 
talking with him. Look at that. Now what we have is one of these great characters of the Old Testament, Elijah, on the Mount of Transfiguration on one side of Christ and Moses on the other side. What you have is the whole Old Testament represented. You have Jesus Christ standing in the middle, which represents the Psalms, the writings, and you have Elijah, which represents the law, and you have, I mean, uh, Elijah represents the prophets, and you have Moses on this side that represents the law. The law, the writings, and the prophets. That encapsulates the whole Old Testament. Elijah is a huge fig figure. As a matter of fact, he's such a big, important figure that he is going to return back in the tribulation period as one of the two witnesses. Revelation chapter number 11. And so we know that we read about his first three and a half years of ministry in 1 Kings and then we read about his second three and a half year ministry in Revelation chapter number 11. Now Elijah is one of those extraordinary characters but he's also an ordinary character. So what do you mean by that? Well James 5 17 the Bible says Elias was a man of like passions. In other words, when we read about these Bible characters, we sometimes put them up on a pedestal, and look, they are, to me, on a pedestal. However, they're flesh and blood like we are. And the Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passion, so that means we can read about Elijah, and we can learn from Elijah. So let's think about that this week as we think about this. His preparation, we see him show up. The Bible says he's the Tishbite. And he's of the inhabitants of Gilead. It tells us nothing about his lineage or his dynasty. Nothing about his dynasty. We don't know about his mother, his father, or brother. We know that, at least from the text here, it doesn't appear that he ever married, ever had any children. We don't know much about his dynasty. He just kind of shows up in Scripture, comes in in a whirlwind, and goes out with a lightning bolt, I guess. But here we have Elijah. We know about his dress in 2 Kings chapter number 1. The Bible says about his dress that he was a hairy man girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. He was a rugged, rough kind of a character. And he wasn't too concerned that everything just looked just right. <laughs> Takes me a long time to get this hairdo ready, is not it? Amen, brother. He was just, what you saw is what you got. It wasn't about him, it was about God. Amen. Notice his dedication. There are many times this is used, or a few times, of him and Elisha both. He mentions the phrase, before whom I stand. And that phrase is actually used in reference to the angel standing in front of God. And that phrase is very important because it's not about the dignitary you're standing in front of that makes you important. It's not about the political party that you're affiliated with that makes you important. It's not about the sports team. Oh man, we did a great job, you know, you have Monday morning uh, managers or Monday morning quarterbacks, or whatever you call it, you know. And they're like, oh man, we didn't do too good yesterday, you know. What do you mean, we? <laughs> you're not the coach. You would lose if you were on the team. What do you mean, we? But what happens is we try to find identification with all these other things. Elijah said, I don't stand in front of any politic, political party. I don't stand in front of a religious denomination. I stand in front of God. Amen. That's who I give account to. and That's who I serve. As the Lord God of Israel liveth. All the other preachers in the land had been silenced, but not Elijah. And all the other sentiment of the land was, Jehovah is dead. Baal lives. Jezebel was teaching her propaganda. She was putting out by her false prophets the idea that God was dead. The idea that there was not a God in Israel anymore. And he said, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, God's alive. I don't care what they're saying about Jesus Christ. I don't care what this world does. I don't care what they say. I don't care what the religions of this world say. God is alive and well. The educational system tries to teach you that you created God instead of God creating you. They got it backwards. God's the one who lives. And the reason I know I have eternal life is because I've been joined up to him. I plugged into eternal life. Amen. Jesus Christ is eternal life, and I'm inside of him. 
as the Lord God of Israel liveth. Notice his dedication. It's not about whether or not he fits in with everybody. It's about whether or not God is pleased with his life. Elijah was studied up, prayed up, cleaned up, and stirred up. He was studied up. Now come over to the book of Deuteronomy real quick. Look in Deuteronomy 28. Y'all bear with me. We're going to get into the mess in just a second. Just want to give you this little bit of prefatory material here. Look in Deuteronomy 28. Now this is a great passage where God gives the stipulations for what we call oftentimes the Palestinian covenant. And it's the covenant that God makes with the late nation of Israel regarding whether or not they can stay in the land of promise or not. And that is based on their works and obedience to God's laws. Now you'll notice here as he pronounces judgment, Deuteronomy chapter number 28, come down if you will to uh, verse number 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Then he goes through all these different curses. Skip all the way down to 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust, from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Elijah knew the word of God. And Elijah is sent with a message based on Deuteronomy 28 to tell the land of Israel they are in trouble because they're falling under the judgment of God. He was studied up. He was prayed up. Elijah could pray and God turn off the water. He could pray and God turn it on. He could pray and God raise up somebody from the dead. He could pray and God would send some extra meal in the barrel. Elijah was a man of prayer, and Elijah was a man that was cleaned up. And that passes in James chapter number 5 when it talks about a man, Elijah, having the power to stop heaven that it rain not. That verse right above it talks about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I don't know about you other preachers, but I feel very inadequate of the task at hand because I am an unclean vessel. I am dirty. But I'm glad the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now God will take us and he'll clean us and he'll try to use us despite ourselves. Just like Elijah here. But Elijah was a man that was prayed up. And he was cleaned up. And he was stirred up. And he swore by God and he stood before God. Now come back to 1 Kings chapter number 17 and back up to verse chapter 16, the end of it. And notice that he's preaching against the leader and the land. He's preaching both against the leader and the land. Notice this is Ahab. You, you kind of just peruse down throughout 25, 28, 29, 30, and 31. You see down in there, Omri is gone and Ahab takes over. He preaches against Ahab. Now he preaches against Ahab's walk because Ahab is walking according to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now what had happened, y'all remember King David, and after King David, Solomon was the son that took over and things went well for a while and they could have been great. The kingdom of heaven could have been realized, but you know what happened? Solomon got led astray and Solomon, because of his sin, the Lord split the kingdom in half. And then when this kingdom got split in half, the northern tribes followed a guy named Jeroboam and he set up two golden calves, one in the north and one down in the southern part, one in Dan up in the north and one down in Bethel. And those two golden calves became a snare. If you read through Chronicles and Kings, you'll keep reading about the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And those other kings of Israel, what they would do is they'd walk in the ways of Jeroboam. And they would do that. And that's exactly what Ahab did. He was following in the wicked footsteps of his predecessors. That was Ahab's walk. But what about Ahab's wife? You see it right here in the passage. Look in 1 Kings 16. Look in verse number 31. It came to pass that if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. She was a wicked woman. And the Bible even tells us in one place that she stirred up Ahab. She stirred him up to do wrong. You know, you can be stirred up to do good and thank God for that. Summer camp's kind of for that reason. Amen. If, you, if your fire can't get lit, your, your wood's wet here. Because, man, it's exciting here. And you can get stirred up for Jesus. All you have to say is Jesus is good. Yeah. 
Everybody gets stirred up. That's good. But you know, you can get around the wrong people and they can stir you up to do bad. They can influence you to sin. And that's exactly what Jezebel did. There was something about Ahab. You'll see later on the end of Ahab's life, he does repent to a degree. Ahab had something inside of him that wanted to do right, but that wicked woman led him astray. You better watch who you let influence you. Paul said, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And then you have Ahab's worship, which is the worship of Baal, not Jehovah. He preached against the leader and he preached against the land. There's no worship of God, so there's going to be no water. That's God's judgment. Now I want to preach from 1 Kings chapter 17, and this is the direction I want to go for this message. And we're going to work through most of Elijah's life this week. But the title of the message tonight is The Trials of Our Faith. The Trials of Our Faith. Because here we have an example with Elijah of someone who is preaching and serving God, doing right, and he goes through a trial along with the rest of the nation. Now think about it for just a minute. Here's Elijah, and he's serving God, and he's doing right, and you come all the way down through verse 7, and eventually that brook dries up, and now Elijah doesn't have any water. Now Elijah can't wash himself. Now Elijah is in a situation where the famine is affecting him. And I heard Brother Robert's prayer and kind of jumping off that just a little bit. I'm sure a lot of you have been through some things, maybe even in the past few months. And here you are, you're trying to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You're trying to do right. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to go through periods of drought. You're going to go through hard times. You're going to go through periods where it seems like there's a famine in the land and maybe things get really dry in your Christian life. Maybe even it feels like the Lord's even moved himself away from you some. You're going to go through those periods in your life. Here's Elijah, one of the greatest men in the Bible, and he went through a trial of his faith. And we're all going to go through trials of our faith. So I want to preach along those lines tonight. Let's look at it, and hopefully we can get some help from the Lord tonight. The first thing I want you to notice is the place of faith. The place of faith. Look in verse number 4. Verse number 4, It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. There. You see that word there? You'll see it pop up a few other times in this chapter. The place of faith. He says the ravens are going to feed thee there. Now what is he doing? He says, I want you to go and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Now we find out later on from 1 Kings chapter 18 what's been taking place. God turned the water spigot off because of Elijah's prayer. He had told Ahab, I'm going to pray and God's going to turn the water off. So as things begin to get tight, as things begin to get rough, guess who Ahab is going to blame for all the problems in the land? He's not going to blame himself, and he's sure not going to blame his wife, and he dare not blame the people because he wants to be elected again. So he's going to blame the preacher. And you find from 1 Kings chapter number 18 when Obadiah comes and they're out there finding grass and God finally tells Elijah, look, you need to go show yourself to Ahab. You find out on Obadiah saying, hey, we were trying to find you, you know, and oh, you're going to disappear and nobody's going to be able to find you. You find out from inference, in other words, just kind of between the lines you read it, that they had been looking for Elijah. Yeah. Ahab wanted to find him and he wanted to kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, when you serve Jesus Christ, you are going to have enemies. I'm not telling you to try to make enemies. I don't think you need to go up to anybody and push them. I don't think you need to start a fight. I don't think you need to get in somebody's face and tell them they're going to go to hell and they're going to roast like a wiener. I don't think you need to do that. You might feel like doing that sometimes. But I'm telling you, when you serve Jesus Christ, you are going to have enemies. And here's Elijah, and they've been coming after him. So you know what God does? God says, look, there's a place that I'm going to take care of you. And I want you to go there. And I want you to hide there. It's a hiding place. It's a place of God's protection. It's a place of God's protection. So notice here in the text, Elijah does. And that's what we're going to see all through the life of Elijah, except a couple places. When God tells Elijah to do something, he does it. 
That's really a great definition of a prophet. A prophet is referred to in the book of Revelation. The Bible refers to them as the servants, the prophets. They're prophets of God because they did what God told them to do. Are you a servant? A servant of Jesus Christ? He hid him there, but not only did he hide him there, not only is he hid there, but he's fed there. He's hid there and he's fed there. He's fed physically and he's fed spiritually. He's fed physically and he's fed spiritually. You know, God will get you into a place and he'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. Yeah. It's Jesus and me along life's highway. Amen. A personal relationship with the Lord. Amen. And yeah, you have some enemies and enemies are good for you. It's good for you to know that this world is against you. Amen. Jesus Christ said, if you follow me, that's how it's going to be. He said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. And so it's good to know that. And you know what it does? It helps you to draw closer to Jesus Christ. And he will feed you physically. He'll feed you spiritually. Notice he feeds physically and he fellowships spiritually. So we see the place is by the brook, the place of faith. But notice the providence of faith. Notice what he does. He sends these ravens to feed him. Now this is the miracle of it when you think about it. The miracle of it is this. Ravens, you have ravens around here. You've seen ravens. We, have, we don't have big ravens where we are. I know out west you have the big ravens. Y'all have big ones here? You've seen them? You know what I'm talking about. They're pretty big. We have crows and stuff. But ravens, they will go. They're scavengers. And they'll go and they'll get food. They'll get stuff like that. And they eat it for themselves. But here's the miracle of it. God uses these ravens to go grab this food. And instead of them eating it, they tell Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your need. Well, maybe you need to be sick. Wow. Wow. What about Christians that love the Lord and there have been a lot of bad things happen to good people? I've told you before that uh, my dad was a great Christian man, great example in my life. He passed away back in 2015 and he got cancer. And my mom had asked him one time, she said, you know how you talk when things like that happen. She said, uh, you know, why you? And he looked right at her and said, why not me? You've heard of David Jeremiah, the preacher down in south. He's south of South California. He's not a Bible believer like us, but he made the statement. He made the statement one time that was very good. He said, you know, very seldom when good things happen to us, do we say, why me? Why me? Oh. It's always when. Not just the time and the testing, but the truth of it about life and then about the Lord. The truth of it is that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And it falls on us as well as, as the unrighteous. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But oftentimes we ask those questions. In 1947, there was a young man who surrendered himself to be a missionary. His name was Glenn Chambers. He boarded a plane in Miami bound for Ecuador. And right before he took off on the plane, he was going to go down and work in ministry as far as uh, broadcasting, radio broadcasting and so forth. And before he got on the plane, he wanted to write his mother a note, so he took a scrap piece of paper that he had found, and he jotted a note on the back of that paper, and he put it in an envelope, and he mailed it to his mother. And he took off on the plane, but he never made it to Ecuador. They hit one of those mountains, and he crashed, and he died. Tragic story. His mother got the letter in the mail after she had already heard about his, her son's death. She opened up the envelope and took it out and he had written on a scrap piece of paper and, and the scrap piece of paper that he had written on was an advertisement and it only had one letter, one word on that advertisement and it was the word why. And she opened up that letter from her son and it said why. You know, you'll hit those trials in your life and the brook dries up in your life and you'll wonder why. And before you point your finger at all those Christians that aren't strong enough in their faith to suck it up for Jesus, you just live a little bit. You just live a little bit. And the Lord knows how to gut punch you. He knows how to test your faith to see if you're still going to love Jesus. He wants to test your faith as we're going to see in our next message whether or not it's all about the miraculous or it's all about His Word. 
Because even as Bible believers, you know what we're always looking for? We're looking for some little sign. We're always looking for some. Well, I know, I know the Lord's real. We don't say this. Well, I know the Lord's real, you know, because he did such and such. God did this and God did that and God did this. You know, I always joke and say, yeah, you know, you, you say, you know, you know the Lord's real because, you know, you found a parking space. When you, when you drove around, we have crisp. Y'all have Krispy Kremes out here? I probably told this here before, but here we go. Krispy Kremes, they turn on the hot donut sign. And so you say, hey, I know the Lord's real because the hot donut sign was on and there was an empty parking space right in front. So I just, whoop, right in. Sign seekers. Of course, you didn't tell the story. You drove around for 30 minutes until the hot sign came on. Then you drove in there. But what the Lord will do is he'll test your faith to see if you're all about the provisions or if you're about the provider. Do you worship him or do you worship what he does for you? As American Christians, we're so materialistic. And we're always looking at these things. And hey, you should thank God for the things he does for you. Hey, I am thankful I've got food in my stomach. I'm thankful I have air to breathe. I'm thankful I have water to drink. I'm thankful for money in my pocket. I'm thankful for these things. God is the provider, and I'm thankful for some of these provisions. I'm thankful I have a car to drive that has air conditioning. I'm thankful for those things. But do you worship God just because of the provisions or because he is the provider? Amen. And I think Elijah has learned this lesson not just about, about life, but about the Lord. Notice the revelation in verse number 8. The Word of God comes to him. For six months, the Word of God doesn't come to him. But the Word of God comes to him after that brook dries up. Have you ever read the Bible and you don't get a whole lot out of it? Wow, I guess not. Maybe I'm the only one that's not spiritual. I mean, you just go through and you read it and you get it and you see it and you go through it. But then when you're going through something in your life and you open up this precious word, maybe in the Psalms. I recommend reading the Psalms. I, if you have the time, read the whole Bible out loud. But I recommend reading the Psalms out loud. Just take them slow. Proverbs, take them slow. Boy, you're going through something. You read one of David's Psalms. Man, that thing ministers to you. Because the brook's drying up. The Word of God comes to you. And sometimes it takes the brook drying up for the Word of God to do something for you. There's a revelation and there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason. Look in verse number 9. Go to Zarephath. And dwell there. There's that word again. There's there. Again. Go there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman. Not just her, but verse number 15. Her and her house, her son. There's a reason the brook dries up. God's got a plan. And he's going to put you right where he wants you, and it might take a trial of your faith to get you there. And he'll get you there. We see the problem of the brook, the pain of the brook. We learn some principles of the brook, but then there's the push of the brook. That brook dries up, and it just pushes us on, and it leads us right where we need to be. Some of you wouldn't have even gotten saved had not you went through some trial in your life. I mean, really. And it takes some time, because we're hard-headed, it takes that brook drying up for us to seek God. I want to encourage you in your faith. I want to encourage you as we think about Elijah this week. To realize the Lord's got a plan for the trials of your faith. There was an old preacher and he would go and he would visit people in the hospital and things like we have to do from time to time. And he'd always take, in his Bible, he'd take a bookmark. And when a person was going through a particularly difficult trial, he would show them this bookmark. And this bookmark was woven in silk. And he'd hand it to them and say, look at this. And they'd look at it, and it was just all these, these lines of silk just going everywhere, and it didn't look like anything. And he'd say, now turn it over. 
And they turn it over and then have that passage in 1 John that says God is love. And have that passage in 1 Peter, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. That thing was woven and it was embroidered in there. But on the one side you couldn't tell it until you flipped it over. And that's how trials are sometimes. You're going through that hard place in your life and you don't feel that God loves you. You don't feel that God cares and you don't understand. But I want to encourage you. Just flip the bookmark over. Amen. Realize the Lord's got a reason for this thing. And there's a trial of your faith. If you were not going through a trial, I would even question if God's going to do anything with you. God puts His servants through trials for a reason. Because He does love you. And He wants to do something for you and with you. Father, I pray You'd bless the Word. Thank You for it. Thank You for the great... Examples we have with Elijah. We pray, Lord, as we learn these things this week, that you may help us, God. Lord, I don't know who's represented here, what's going on in the hearts of your people, but you do. God, I pray that you'd meet in a very special way and minister in a very special way with the Word of God. We thank you so much for Jesus, our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.